This is the beginning of the last week of this uh, four-week course, and maybe just as well since the ranks seem to be thin thinning out, and if we wait much longer, I'll be the only person left. And then, of course, I could go much faster. So, um, so the last uh, part of the course is uh, today and tomorrow, and I'm going to give now somewhat more specific applications of the whole story we've built up. Let me first re repeat a little, or remind a little what we did last time and what I also talked about at the conference. So the bloch kunkov theorem and related things. So if we have, uh, first of all, I denoted P by the set of all partitions. So this is, we think of a partition, there are many ways of writing it, but the most standard is to think of a partition as an infinite decreasing sequence of numbers, of positive integers, non-negative integers, with only finitely many being non-zero. And so you can write this, I, I write Pn uh, for the set of lambda, which are partitions of n, which I also write by saying that the size of lambda, which is the sum of the lambda i's, is n. And then if you had any function at all, from P to, well, actually any building group, but let's say to Q, uh, so any function, then we associated to it a power series, which is, uh, this was the bloch kunkov construction, so this will be a power series in Q of Q, as I say, you could take any building group here, A, and then just take, have A of Q, and this is defined as the sum over lambda over all lambda, of f of lambda divided by the sum of 1. But of course, that wouldn't converge. And then you make it converge by putting a weighting factor, which is q to the lambda. And actually, it's uh, more intelligent, I'll put this in red, to subtract a 24th from both the numerator and the denominator, I mean, from the exponents. Of course, that doesn't change the sequence. But if I do that, then this thing is 1 over uh, q to the 1 24th times the product 1 minus q to the n by an identity of Euler and this denominator, and that is 1 over the famous eta function of tau, where eta of tau is defined by that product. So q is e to the 2 pi tau, and eta of tau is a multiple form. So already from the fact that the, what the physicists would call the partition function, it's a little confusing since I'm summing over partitions, and this sum itself can be written as the sum p of n, q to the n, where p of n is the partition function, so we're using the word partition triply. But in statistical physics, you have a function, uh, some kind of an, op of an observable, and you have a set of states, which here would be all partitions, and you, you take the average value, the expectation value of the observable is the sum over all of these potential states in some huge ensemble of the observable evaluated at the state times a weighting function, which in traditional uh, classical physics of uh, Boltzmann and Maxwell and so on is e to the minus the energy of the state, so the size of lambda, like the energy, divided by the temperature, uh, properly normalized. So here you have this kind of statistical average, and already the fact that this so-called partition function, as it's always called in statistical physics, so the sum of the weights, you know, e to the minus the energy over the temperature, that function we see here is itself a multiple form, and so this looks multiple, and so there's the general question, which is one of the key things I want to talk about in this course and have talked about a lot, uh, is, or when is, since we already know the answer that it sometimes is, when is FQ multiple itself, given that the denominator is a kind of a multiple form? And then we already saw that it's uh, actually much better to take quasi multiple I'm not going to repeat all of the definitions of quasi multiple I've gone through it already a couple of times. But we found that there were several interesting cases. One, well, the most general was the, uh, well, the first was the theorem if nu t of lambda is the value, well, I've, again, I've explained that several times. It's the value of the sum uh, uh, over ij 
So lambda is a partition of some n, and you take here all partitions, all transpositions, so that means you take i less than j and flip them, and you take the, uh, you interchange i and j, that's a central element of the group algebra, of the symmetric group, and if you apply that to the irreducible representation labeled by the partition lambda, then by Schur's lamb it's a constant, it's some integer. So this is a typical case, and the first case was that mu t of m q is a modular form, quasi-modular form, of weight 2m. I, I recall just very briefly that the quasi-modular forms we're talking about are on the full modular group, and they're simply polynomials in three power series that I've written down several times. And so even if you don't know or care about modular forms, it's something very explicit. So the first statement is that nu t, this particular function, and all of its powers have quasi-modular things. I should say that nu t of the dual partition, so the dual partition corresponds to the kind of dual representation, contragredient, but it also is flipping the Young diagram. So if you have a Young diagram like this, you, you flip it like this in the usual way, then nu t just changes sign. That's very easy to see from the definition or from anything else. And uh, so this thing is only, sorry, this is, in, excuse me, weight 3m. But there are no quasi multiple forms of odd weight. And then because of this, you see that if m is odd, then this thing is zero. Uh, so that was the case. And the special case, nu t to the 2g minus 2, was uh, this thing was connected with counting uh, covers uh, of the torus by a surface of genus G, where you count by taking the sum Q to the n times the sum of this uh, times the nth coefficient, uh, times uh, where n is the degree, or D is the degree Q to the D. Okay, so this was the original example of this, which was the theorem discovered by Daycraft and proved by Kanek and myself. And then there was a huge generalization that your functions q0 of lambda is 1, q1 of lambda happens to be 0, identically. q2 of lambda is the size of lambda minus the 24th. q3 of lambda is this new t. But then there are many more whose definition I won't repeat, but I explained. And so you have all of these things. And if f is any polynomial, in variables q1, q2, and so on. But then I think of qk not just as an indeterminate, but also as this function. So I can think of f in this way as a function on partitions. Then that was the theorem of bloch okunkov whose proof I uh, gave, actually, completely. And the theorem is that this is then always a quasi multiple form. And in fact, if the correct weight, if you assign to qi the weight i, and you have a homogeneous polynomial weighted homogeneous of degree k, then you will get a quasi multiple form of weight k. Of course, zero if, if k is odd, again. So that was two examples. But then we had several others. And one of them was sp of lambda, which is the sum of the lambda j to the p, j from 1 to infinity, where p is positive and odd. Then I showed that sp q is g p plus 1, I'll write q, but it's a slight abuse of, abuse of notation, minus the constant term. So this thing, gp was the Eisenstein series. It had a constant term, which is some Bernoulli number. I won't recall because I'm subtracting it anyway. And then this had as its nth coefficient uh, simply sigma p of n q to the n, where sigma p of n is the sum of the pth powers of the positive divisors of n. So that is certainly a multiple form, quasi-multiple form, because we know that gk, for k even, is quasi-multiple if k is 2 and actually multiple. So it's a polynomial even in e4 and e6 if k is 4 or bigger. And then, of course, the constant is certainly a quasi-multiple form of weight 0. So this thing is mixed weight. It is weight p plus 1 and weight 0, and the two pieces. But then another construction was you took this, I called the Miller transform. And the Miller transform for any function at all had almost trivially the property that applying it to any function uh, from p to q uh, doesn't change the q bracket. So here m, this was I call the 
Miller transform because he found it in his work with Da Wei Chen when, in connection with the ziegel weech constants that he talked about in the conference. I mean, he found it for the particular case of S minus 1. Uh, that was the function they needed, but then uh, this, the, the proof that this is true works for any function. So mf of lambda is defined, if lambda is a partition of n, as 1 over n factorial times the sum over other partitions of n. And now we think of partitions of n, I'm just reminding you, in two different ways. On the one hand, mu corresponds to a conjugacy class uh, in Sn. So all of the points, whose, all of the elements of Sn whose cycle structure is given by the uh, given cycle. The symmetric group has the very unusual property among all finite groups that the set of conjugacy classes and the set of irreducible representations, which for, for any finite group have the same cardinality, but in general are not at all in bijective correspondence. But here they are. They're both labeled canonically by partitions. So here I think of mu as being a conjugacy class, but then I think of uh, lambda as being an irreducible representation, pi lambda, and it has a character. And then you take uh, chi lambda on any element of that conjugacy class, but you take that thing squared. I don't actually need the absolute value because another special property of the symmetric groups that the conjugacy classes here are ordinary integers in Z, so their squares are positive anyway. And then you take f of mu. So this was the definition of this Muller transform, that you take a weighted sum of the f of mu, where the weight is given by this n factorial by n factorial matrix, 1 over n factorial, size of c mu times chi lambda c mu squared. And then that matrix has the property that if you sum its coefficients over lambda, the sum of this over all lambda is 1 for every mu. So when I sum this over all lambda, then I just get the sum over all mu of f of mu, which means that the q bracket hasn't changed. So that gives us lots and lots of examples in two different ways. First, you can take, uh, uh, so an example would be tp, is, I define as MP, uh, m of sp. So you do this thing where f of mu is sp of mu. That was the one actually for originally t minus 1 was the one that uh, Da Wei Chen and Martin Miller needed in their study of the ziegel weech constants. And they could uh, evaluate the volumes and the ziegel weech uh, constants needed if they knew some modularity properties of this together with some as asymptotic properties, which eventually uh, Miller and I were able to work out. And that's the, the joint paper with kind of two disjoint halves. So I'll talk about that in a moment. But so you can take any function that happens to already be modular. For instance, a function of the block of Kunkov ring, it's not at all preserved, that ring by m. So if you now apply m to that thing, and sp is not in the ring, so this is a different example. But if you take either sp or something in the block of Kunkov ring and a power, apply any power of m, you get a new function, which is quasi multiple and that gives you a whole bunch. Also, you can apply m inverse. m inverse is not well defined. It's got a kernel. But if you happen to have a g such that m of g is your given f, then that g is some m inverse of f. And since the q bracket doesn't change, then that g will still have a, uh, a quasi-multitor q bracket if f did. So you can apply positive or negative powers of m, but only negative if it happens to work. So you get lots and lots of examples. And I gave even one other example uh, using the arm and leg lengths and polynomials in the arm and leg lengths of the boxes or the cells of the Young diagram. But for now, I wanted to talk a little more about this example. Sure. No, of course not. I mean, no, look at it. Come on. It's not even close. I mean, it's a huge sum of n factorial terms. If I mean, why on earth should it? No, no. It uh, that would be. I mean, there's no no conceivable reason. If you if you take m of f g, then you're summing, you know, this times f of mu g of mu times this huge factor. And whereas if I took m of f times m of g, then I would have the sum f of mu prime times g of uh, f of mu times g of mu prime times this huge factor twice. And you're asked whether this matrix squared is the identity. I mean, that would be some uh, very strange property of the character matrix. No, it's not true at all, of course. No, no, there's nothing multiplicative. I mean, the, the multiplicative structures, 
very, very misleading. This is a ring, and I keep calling it the Blochow-Kunkov ring because it's generated by, you know, it's written as a ring. It's polynomials in some generators. But the bracket and all of this structure has nothing to do with the ring structure. I mean, it does, but in a very, very complicated way. It's not at all a ring homomorphism. And certainly the M uh, is not compatible with either the ring structure or with the bracket. Or with, sorry, it is compatible with the bracket, but not at all with the ring structure. OK, so no, that would be really remarkable. And it would be some, anyway, if it were true, it would be trivially true. But it's already false, I think, for n equals 2. OK, so. Uh, so what it, yeah, I want to talk a little about this example. As I say, it was this particular function, t minus 1, which, uh, so let's start with s minus 1. So I didn't quite define s minus 1, because here I defined sp as the pth moment of the parts. But since the parts in general can be 0, then of course you can't take negative powers. So here, uh, you simply go, you simply take the parts that are non-zero. And then you take the reciprocal. So it's a very, very strange invariant. So lambda now has a certain length. And but I stop at that length. So when Martin showed me that, actually I, my reaction, which was right, but it turned out I was wrong anyway, but still it's the right reaction, I said, that's a ridiculous invariant. Because you shouldn't make an invariant where you artificially cut something. These partitions in a natural sense, have an analytic continuation, I mean, a continuation to an infinite sequence. Lambda length plus 1 is 0. And you can't take one of this. And he said, well, I'm sorry. That's what we need. And I said, you, you must have made a mistake. That's such a strange invariant. You can't possibly use it for anything. And he said, I'm sorry. That's what comes up. Can you calculate it? Because they had done a lot of numerical calculations. And they couldn't figure out what this function was at all. So I want to start, because that's kind of fun by saying it. So first, let's take an example. So I'm going to take a really simple example. n is 3. And this is the partition 1, 1, 1 with the Young diagram. Or, or, if, or if you wish, it's 3 with the Young diagram. It doesn't really matter. Sorry, it, does, it, it, it doesn't matter for the, for the TP uh, very much. I'm, I'll take whichever one. Here, I didn't actually say which way you make the one. I want the one where the corresponding representation is trivial. So let's say lambda corresponds to the trivial representation. Sorry? Uh, L of lambda, thank you. But if mu were lambda, I would have wanted mu. OK, which it will be in a second. OK, so now I want to compute. T lambda, I didn't really say there are two ways to identify Young diagrams with things. And some people, I think, do it horizontally. Some do it vertically. Uh, I want, here, I only have to say what the representation is. Let's take, take the trivial representation. Or for that matter, the sign representation. It won't really change because minus 1 squared and plus 1 squared are the same. So lambda is the trivial or the sign. So in other words, it's either this Young diagram or it's this Young diagram. I don't really care. In fact, it'll always, this uh, TP is always going to be independent of whether you flip lambda or not. So let's take that. So here I have mu. And here I have the size of mu of the um, corresponding constant class. So there are three possible partitions of three. You can take 1 plus 1 plus 1, or you can take 1 and 2. I guess I'm doing a decreasing. Or you can take 3. So this is the cycle structure in the symmetric group of the identity. So there's one such element. This is the cycle structure of an involution. There are three involutions. This is the cycle structure of a cyclic element of order three. There are two of them. So that's the C mu. Chi lambda of C mu, of course, is really stupid in this case. It's plus or minus one. But if I squared, it's always one. So that's chi lambda of mu squared. And finally, S minus one of mu. Well, I take the sum of the reciprocals of the parts. So here it's. 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3. Here it's 1 plus a half. And here it's a third. So that's the s minus 1 of lambda. And so t minus 1 of the trivial representation will be, well, first I have to divide by 3 factorial, which is 6. And then I have to take this, so let me divide by 36 so that I put a common numerator of 6. So this one becomes 18. Here I'm putting a 6, so this becomes 9 times 3 is 27. 
And here I'm taking 6 times 3, that's 2 times 2 is 4. So this is 49 over 36. So, I mean, they had already calculated quite a few of these, but the formula is, you know, you don't even see particularly what is that. What function is this? Even for the uh, simplest Young diagram. So I played with it. And uh, of course, I'm, my specialty is recognizing numbers. Martin's is proving theorems. So I guessed the formal eventually, and he uh, proved it. Or he actually found the, the more elegant way to state it. I had formed it in a somewhat more awkward way. But what happens experimentally is if you take t minus 1 of the trivial young diagram of length n, so just one row of size n, then you get something. So I first had a table, and then I recognize the numbers. It's actually not very hard. It's the partial sum, the nth partial sum of zeta of 2, which is kind of cute. So in particular, the limiting value uh, exists and is zeta of 2. OK, but that was experimental. It's by no means obvious if you do this calculation. I mean, in other words, what I'm saying is this the same as 1 plus a quarter plus a ninth, as you can quickly check. But it's not particularly obvious if you have n, then you'll have p of n terms here with you know, some complicated sum of reciprocals here times this times this, and you get that. So it's not particularly obvious why this is true, even for this very trivial Young diagram. But the general theorem, which I'll admit the proof, it's about a page long if you're interested, the papers on both of our websites. Uh, you, you can look it up. It's a one-page proof, but it uses some of the representation theory of the symmetric group and sort of formulas with rim lengths and hook lengths, and I don't want to go into it. But the theorem is in general that Tp of lambda, well, T minus 1 of lambda, is the sum. And now you take the cells, I'll put S or boxes, cells, whatever, in the Young diagram. So as usual, we think of the, uh, we associate to lambda its Young diagram, which is this collection of boxes. And then each cell, so for instance, this might be a cell, it is a hook length, which in general you take, I've explained that several times, and most of you know it very well. Anyway, you take the arm and the leg length, so everything to the left, everything below it, until you get to the edge of the uh, Young diagram, and everything to the right. And then the hook length is the total size of this. So in the classical notation, the arm length would be this part to the right, the leg length would be this part strictly below, and you take the arm length plus the leg length, so the hook length in the classical notation would be A of S plus B of S plus 1 for the square and the upper thing, and I prefer the slightly modified arm length where you add a half to each of them uh, so that one of them is, each one is a half integer, integer plus a half. Anyway, the hook length is that total length, and the statement here is that you have to take the hook length of S squared. So you see in the case of this trivial Young diagram, the hook length is 1, 2, 3, up to n, and so you get indeed the sum 1 over i squared from i from 1 to n. But this is the general theorem, and more generally, Tp of lambda for any lambda is the sum s in y lambda of h of s to the power p minus 1. So the Muller transform of the pth part moment is the p minus first hook moment. Here's a nice statement. Maybe I'll even write that just for fun. The piece part moment of a partition, well, of partitions, so that's a function on partition, the piece part moment is, and this is true whether p is even, odd, positive, or negative, uh, as long as you define sp for p negative, uh, emitting the zero terms to a negative power. OK, so that's a theorem which is, uh, as I say, was discovered experimentally by looking at dozens of cases when s was minus 1. And we actually did this case. It would have probably been easier to have p as a variable. And then one would have found the formula maybe more easily, maybe not. And anyway, that was the final result. And it's a relatively elementary, but not, uh, certainly not trivial proof. OK, so that was one theorem. And the, another theorem is that if p is odd, then Tp belongs to the block of Kunkoff ring. So that certainly explains. See, I mean, as a corollary of this, as a corollary of this statement, we already know that if p is odd, 
then the TP, it's Q bracket. Since it's the Miller transform, the Miller transfer doesn't change Q brackets. It's the same as the one of SP. And so it's equal to this GP plus 1 of Q uh, minus its constant term, which is some Bernoulli number. So we already know that. And so you see in particular that it's Q bracket is modular. But the statement here is much stronger. The function TP itself is a hook length. In fact, let me be a little more precise. Let me write TP slightly modified. Uh, I simply don't care about the even TPs because they have no good properties. So T, TP modified for P even will just be 0. But for P odd uh, and positive, it will be TP. But I want to add to it this constant term, which is uh, B P plus 1. Well, it's the constant term, so it's t times p plus 1, if I remember correctly, where b is the Bernoulli number. OK, which, uh, well, actually, there's a better way to write it. Let me remind you once and again, once and for all, g p plus 1 of tau, remember, was the sum sigma p of n, q to the n, n from 1 to infinity, plus a constant term. If you think what this is, this is the sum I repeated that, but I'll repeat it again. It's the divisors of n, but the positive divisors of 1 of d to the power p. So formally, if n is 0, uh, you would have to take all divisors of 0, but every positive number is a divisor of 0. Of course, the sum d to the p, if d runs over positive divisors, diverges. But formally, it's the Riemann zeta function evaluated as zeta of minus p. But since for negative n you don't put that sum, negative n's also have divisors, you, you, the negative ones you omit, then the one for 0 you should take half. That's the general rule in any kind of combinatorics. And so the sort of natural formula for the constant term would be a half zeta of minus p. And according to Euler, zeta of minus p uh, is e6, let's see, zeta of 1 minus k, for instance, if k is 2 is minus a 12th, it's bk over k. And here I'm taking half of it, so it's bk over 2k with a minus sign. So I think this is correct. But anyway, maybe a better way to write this would be uh, uh, the way I just did. OK, so I'm, I hope I got the sign right. It's not at all important. I mean, it's important, but not for us. I can't read what I wrote, but somewhere it must yeah, that's right. Uh, no, it's plus a half. Oh, yeah, because the constant term is minus a half. So it's, it's this, then probably this is with minus. Anyway, it's whichever way it is to, to make it come out modular. So then uh, the statement now is that TP tilde is, of course, then I can drop odd because now it's always true. And now this is modular of weight P plus 1 in all cases. Because, again, if it had some weight K, then it would have to give you a homogeneous thing. Before, we had homogeneous plus this constant, but I've added the constant. And now it not only has a Q bracket, which is quasi multiple of weight K plus 1, but it itself is an element of the block of ring of that weight P plus 1. And in fact, the full theorem is TP tilde is P minus 1 factorial over 2, which is the sum K from 0 to P plus 1 of QK times Q P plus 1 minus K. Oh, sorry, minus 1 to the K, the alternating sum. And you see that if p is odd, this alternating sum is 0. But if p is even, then this alternating sum is something in the block of ring. So this is in the block of ring, and it's homogeneous of weight p plus 1. So again, that's a non-trivial theorem, but it's like a one-page or one-and-a-half-page proof. Uh, we don't use for that the definition of TP as the Miller transform. We have already proved this part, and then we use the sum of hook lengths and a messy proof summing over Young diagrams and counting the box is the right way. But it's completely elementary. So this gives, so in a sense, this isn't a new example. I was listing interesting examples of functions with quasi multiple things. Then TP is actually not an interesting example, because although it comes by applying a very non-obvious transformation, which preserves quasi multiplicity to a function which is quasi multiple but is not in the block of Konkov ring, but TP itself, which is M of SP, is in fact in the block of Konkov ring. And so the fact that it's quasi multiplicity is not a surprise, but the fact that it's in the ring, that's very surprising. 
Okay, so now comes, yeah, sorry? Well, sure, I mean, this is just, uh, just by definition, I mean, that's what's written here. This just means you think of this as a vector. I'm applying the matrix, I mean, here, this is the matrix lambda mu, and I'm applying it to f, and here's m of f. If you think of this as a vector, say, written vertically, then f has the coefficients f mu, this is this, and so this is the matrix whose lambda mu coefficient is c mu times chi lambda of mu squared. I mean, by definition, so that's a matrix. Uh, or Well, I haven't chosen a basis. Uh, I don't know. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. Uh, yeah, y yeah. If, if you wish. I mean, this is a map from symmetric from p n to itself. Uh, sorry, from z of p uh, from q of p n to itself. Q. Sorry, this thing is a map from q to the power of p n to itself, and it's a linear map because I'm just sending each character to its matrix. So, of course, I can compose, I mean, I can apply that matrix to any base, and I get another basis. So if I take the original basis, which is 0, 0, 0, 1, and I'm just adding the coefficients, then I get, I guess, a new base, if you wish, which is uh, these numbers. Uh, I don't really know. I wasn't actually using a basis of partitions, so I don't know what you mean. Does it correspond to changing base? I was using the sum of partitions, but if you wish, you could say that the sum partitions of f, which is all that I'm using in the Q bracket, if you want to think of f as the sum f sub lambda times e lambda, where e is the basis, which is 1 at a particular partition and 0 elsewhere, then, of course, this would be the sum of the coefficients. But I wasn't particularly choosing a basis, so I don't. But anyway, it's, it's just. But if I chose a base, I would be now choosing a new base by applying this matrix to it. What? Well, you can do that, but uh, I mean, I'd, I'd, maybe you can even work out what that is. But <laughs> well, it could be, but but the shore base is not a natural basis, as far as I know. If you apply this to the shore basis, to a what? Yeah, but, it's, but I mean, if the process of taking a matrix, A, B, C, D, and taking the piecewise square, which it isn't quite because there's a diagonal factor, is not a very natural thing. I'm not, I don't really want to think about it because I have nothing interesting to say. You can, I mean, we can discuss it afterwards. I don't want to discuss now. I have absolutely nothing to say on this. But I believe it's not a natural question here in the sense that, for instance, the Shore base, which is a wonderful basis for partitions, is not at all good for the block of Kronkopf map as far as I know. Although, you know, then having some discussions that maybe one can do something, but it's just, I, I don't know. But anyway, you can think about it better than I can, but I have no interesting thing to say about that. But I'm just applying this matrix. The only noticeable thing about this matrix is that if you add up the, the elements of any column, you get one, which is the same as saying that if you apply this to the matrix 1, 1, 1, 1, you get 1, 1, 1, 1. That is a property of this matrix because of orthogonality. Therefore, if you apply to any vector f uh, the Muller transform, which is this, and take the sum of its coefficients, it's the same. That's all I'm saying. But whether this matrix is per se an interesting thing with respect to some special basis, it's, it's a reasonable question. I actually didn't think of it at all. But it would only be reasonable in this context if you had a basis for which this modularity or the Q bracket becomes a natural object. And so far as I know, there aren't such bases. So, uh, you know, I don't really know quite what that means. What is interesting, and what one could certainly ask, is things like, let me take as a basis of, of functions q1 to the l1, q2 to the l2, and so on. So the basis of the block of Kuhngoff ring, and ask, what is m of this? Or is there a canonical m inverse of that? There may be many. But is there any natural thing? And then that would again have q multiple brackets. But as far as I know, you get nothing. I mean, I, I tried a few. I could see nothing. So there's no obvious compatibility between any of these operations. 
This doesn't respect the ring structure. That doesn't respect the ring structure. This doesn't respect that. But occasionally, you can combine things, and you get interesting functions like this TP, which is Miller of SP, and which for P odd is, in fact, in the block of Kunkov ring. Anyway, those are the statements I have up to now. So now I want to give kind of the main combinatorial theorem that we found about this whole modularity structure. So by far the hardest. All of these theorems were relatively easy. They took some work to find, actually. But, sorry? No, no, not at all. Here, P is positive and odd. There is no T minus 1 tilde. I'll come to T minus 1 shortly. But here, not. Not at all. Thank you. Uh, no, I mean, anyway, it wouldn't be very interesting. R0 would be 1. And T minus 1 is a very interesting function. That's the one that gives the siegel Veach constants. It's not 1 at all. So no, absolutely not. This is as written for P positive. So the theorem is here for P positive. Thank you. OK, well, for T0 too, because since Tp is 0 for uh, even P, it's also true. For, it's even true, true for minus 2 since it's 0, but it's not true for minus 1. OK, so as I said, this theorem took quite a lot of work to discover. I mean, I spent about, I don't know, two days with the computer working out various random examples of t minus 1 of lambda. First, I had to notice that when you took the 1, 2, 3, that those numbers were the partial sums. And then I worked, uh, you know, look, took this thing where you had n and a single 1 and stared at those for a while and found the formula, and then for 2, and then for 3, and then for any block AB, and then for a block ABC. And after two days, I guessed a general formula. And then with Martin, we fiddled with it and put it in the form that it was the Miller transform, so we now would call it, of this uh, SP and then that, that he proved. So this took a little bit of work to prove, but still, it's basically an elementary theorem. And this also took a bit of work after we discovered it to prove. It was a surprise. We didn't expect these things to be in the block of Kunkov ring at all. But you always check. If you have something which is quasi-modular, you check. And most of the ones we checked, I checked. I, I was the one who was looking at all the counterexamples. were not, but this particular one was. And so we proved that, too. As I say, it's tedious, but elementary. But the next thing that I want to tell, that I mentioned or highlighted a bit in my lecture in the conference, is very, very far. From, from trivial, it took us uh, about two years of experimental work to find the complete statement of the theorem. So we had to choose, compute dozens and dozens of cases, each of which was a large amount of work, summing over partitions up to size you know, 15 or something, or 20, on the computer, and then trying to recognize the coefficients. And so it took a long, long time even to find the formula, and it took another year or so before we finally found the proof. And I'm not going to explain. Uh, the proof at all. It's long and technical and not particularly uh, exciting, but anyway, I wouldn't begin to have time. But the statement is very beautiful. Well, there's a series of statements that become more and more precise. So the first statement is that if you take any p greater than or equal to zero, we now know by the theorem that is written there that this tp tilde, which we, which we defined as the Muller transform of the p part length, what we now know is also the p minus first hook length. If you take that function and multiply it by f, then since we know that tp tilde for p positive is in the block of Kunkov ring, and f is in the block of Kunkov ring, and it's a ring, so the product is in the block of Kunkov ring, so this must be uh, some uh, modular form. And the question is, if you fix f and vary p, how does it depend on p? And the reason we wanted that is what we really want is t minus 1 times f. That's what came, this is not quasi in, in general, but it's very nearly, as, as I'll write in a few minutes. This is the one that one needed for the calculations of the volumes. Maybe I'll even say, if you were at Martin Miller's talk at the conference, so the volumes of the well, I'll just put the volume of the principal stratum of flat moduli space, so I think it's called omega mg. This corresponds, I mean, knowing that, you have to, for all g, is the same as knowing, well, now I have to be careful because it involves cumulants. It involves knowing certain, uh, I'll say it later when I talk about cumulants, we have to know explicitly how to compute uh, this uh, Q bracket 
as a quasi multiple form and then use asymptotics of coefficients of quasi multiple forms for certain f. But to get the Ziegel Veach constants, which he explained, which I won't talk about today at all, I might say a few words tomorrow, then you need something slightly different, which is t minus 1 fq, which is not quite quasi multiple, but still it's, it's a perfectly well defined q series, and you need to know the asymptotics. And so for that, we wanted to know what kind of a function do you get if you multiply something which is in the block of Kunkoff ring by t minus 1, which is not in the block of Kunkoff ring. But we knew that if you took tp, where p is positive and odd, once we found this theorem, then we knew that that thing at least would be quasi modular. And so we started studying what quasi modular form do you get. And the first and weakest statement that we get is that there's a map rho ijq, which goes from the block of Kunkoff ring into quasi modular forms. And so if you take this map, sorry, it's capital F, and you take all i and j of the, all i and j, and then you multiply here by g to the power i plus p plus 1 j, then that's the theorem. So, so there are linear maps. That was the sort of discovery first on the computer that there are linear maps, now many, many ways to produce quasi multiple forms, one for every pair i and j. So let me remind you, for the sixth time, gk of q is a constant, which is minus bk over 2k, plus the sum sigma k minus 1 of n, q to the n. And this is a quasi multiple form of weight k if k is even, which it is here. So here, uh, I, I just said g uh, odd index, I just defined to be 0, OK? So gk is that, and gk, if I have any function f, then fn of q is d to the n, well, fn. I just mean d to the n, where d is q d by dq. OK, so here I take the jth derivative of an Eisenstein series. So this is certainly a multiple, if you want, of q. So that's quasi multiplicative because the gk is quasi multiplicative and der derivation. And the other important thing is that the weight of this this operator is homogeneous at its degree minus i minus 2j. So the weight goes down. And therefore, if you start with f, it's a polynomial. So there's some maximal weight k. Then you only have terms for i plus 2j less than or equal to k. So it's a finite sum. And therefore, this whole thing is therefore, as we of course knew, we know that this is quasi multiplicative because that's in the block of Kunkoff ring and so it's f. So this had to be quasi multiplicative But the dependence on p is that it's a universal combination if you fix f, of finitely many derivatives of Eisenstein series, the i and the, the j tells you which derivative, the i tells you which shift, but the dependence on p is just the index of the Eisenstein series. So that's uh, the sort of basic formula. And now that would be fairly useless if one, so this is what we first found as a conjecture, but of course you can't prove such a conjecture abstractly. You can only prove it if you can figure out what rho ij of fq is. Uh, and then you can try to prove you, know, you need an explicit formula. So the next more refined statement is, of course, the first thing you would guess is that rho ij of f, this q series, is itself the q bracket of something in the block of Kunkoff ring. Now, alone, that's an empty statement because the, the mapping of this q bracket, which goes from the block of Kunkoff ring to multiple forms, is <laughs> surjective. It's much more than surjective. I mean, you have way, way more on the left than you have on the right. So therefore, anything is the image of something. But here the statement is that there's a canonical map from the block of Kunkoff ring to itself, again, of degree minus i minus 2j, a canonical linear map, uh, where canonical doesn't yet mean too much, but it will in a second. So there's a specific map. And so you have this rather surprising structure that you get a finite number of terms, but the number depends on the, on the degree of f. So as a function on tp, it's an infinite sum. You get infinitely many operators rho ij, but only finitely many are non-zero on any argument f. And then you use those as coefficients times appropriate derivatives of Eisenstein series. So this is the basic thing that we are going to use, but we need information about how, these, uh, how this row ij of f looks, and we want to know what it is. So let me tell you that story. So 
As I said, by looking at success of special cases, you kind of pin it down. I won't go through the whole saga, but the uh, sort of key steps that we want. So the first thing is rho 0, 0 is the identity, whereas rho 0, i, no, i comma 0, is 0 for i bigger than 0. So we'll, in particular, this starts, so this thing starts the identities, that's fq times g p plus 1 of q plus, and then we'll have terms with j positive. And that's kind of nice because the fact that j is positive means you're differentiating at least once, which means you're killing these silly Bernoulli numbers that we aren't really very interested in. So, so the main, you know, the sort of leading term is gp plus 1 of q times fq, for what that's worth. Okay, so that's uh, how it begins. Then the next statement is that rho 0, 1 is actually a certain derivation, d2. So in the proof of Bloch-Kunkov that I gave last week, we had the operator d, which was the, the derivation, derivation, and this was the sum q k minus 1 d by dqk. And so d2, or dl, would be the same sum with k l minus l, so k from l to infinity. q0, I remind you, is uh, 1. So this is not, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's not quite a derivation. Yeah, sorry, it is a derivation, uh, even though it has this q0 term. So for every l, we have a derivation. And I use d1 uh, in the proof of bloch kunkov I called it d. And so now I'm using d2. So rho 0, 1 is this particular differential operator, which is here, first order differential operator derivation. And then another property is, if you remember, that we had an easy property. If you have d, which is this map that I already reminded you, qd by dq, which is the same if you think of q as e to the 2 pi tau as 1 over 2 pi i times the tau derivative, that preserves quasi-modular forms. But we have the property that if you take anything in the block of ring and differentiate its Q bracket, that's the same as if you uh, take, let's see, I'm getting, that's the same as if you multiply F by Q2, that's a new function. I mean, uh, FQ2 is a function in the block of ring, and so this also is. You take the Q bracket of Q2 times F, and you subtract or add, you add, E2, the second Eisenstein series, over 24 times the, block of, times the bracket of F itself. So we had that formula. And if you apply this, then you immediately find that rho ij for any ij, if you just make it compatible. So take this hypothetical formula, apply d to both sides. Then d on the left, you have to do this. And d on the right, it's, you have to differentiate this times that and differentiate this times that, but you differentiate this, you just send j up by 1. And so if you do that, what you find is that rho ij of q2 of f is equal to q2 rho ij of f plus rho ij minus 1 of f, which I can write then uh, more succinctly by saying that rho ij, uh, I don't know where I've written it, but anyway, I can just write it that, no, I guess I should put it in the right order, the bracket of multiplication with q2, the uh, commutator, of the operator rho ij with multiplication by q2 is rho ij minus 1. So that at least gives us a first, you know, a few uh, properties of the rho ij for small i and j. And then from this, you can work out rho ij on any power of q2, and also on any power of q1 turns out to be easy. But uh, the first interesting case is the one that you need for all of these applications. The main point here is essentially your powers of, of Q, which is the one that was originally needed by Daycraft and the theorem that Kanek and I proved was just powers of Q3, which remembers the function nu t, the kind of this multiplier function for the transposition conjugacy class. So the, main, the, the most interesting case is when f is a power of Q3, that's the first really interesting case. And there, the, there's a closed formula that we found again by experimentally. So to do these experiments, you take a given function, a given element of the block of Kunkov ring, like Q3 to the sixth. 
And then you multiply it by TP tilde, which we have explicitly, or where P is 1, 3, 5, 7, 10. You take a whole bunch of them, and then it's supposed to be a combination of these things, but there are only finitely many things here. And these functions are linearly, become linearly dependent if you let P become a variable. So if you take enough P's for a given F, you can find this as a Q series. And if you believe that it's uh, uh, in the uh, quasi multiple form, you can identify it as a quasi multiple form. But then you don't know what row IJ is. You only know what the Q bracket of row IJ is. So you have to guess. So you successfully compute the next term, find the Q bracket of, let's say, row 3, 2. But then you don't know what it is. But based on the previous ones, you make a guess what it might be and find the best form. And so after a while, you, you do this. And in the case of row IJ, the form is so nice that you don't have any doubt that it's correct. Well, first of all, the Q bracket is 0 unless i is less than or equal to j, which is less than or equal to n. So it's quite reasonable to lift 0 to 0, although, of course, there are many other ways to lift it. So our ansatz in this particular case is that you only get something non-zero if 0 less than or equal to i less than or equal to j less than or equal to n. And then what you get is rather simple. It's 2 to the i times i plus 1 factorial times n minus j factorial times q3 to the power n minus j times q i minus j. As I say, even this simple formula was, you know, like you, you may need a large number of experiments to find this, because A, you need a lot of several n. For each n, you need many values of Tp to identify the coefficients. But then you only have their Q expansions, and there are several things you can do to lift until you guess that it might have this simple form. And then, of course, it's easy to find the coefficients. So this is the simplest case of how these operators look. And so if I look at that, then I see that the operator that sends q3 to the n over n factorial to q3 to the n minus j over n minus j factorial is just d to the j by dq3 to the j. But of course, that's only on polynomials in q3. So if I apply rho ij to a polynomial in q3, then to send q3 to the n over n factorial to q3 to the n minus j, so this is obviously n minus j, excuse me, that was a typo, to n minus j over n minus j factorial, that's just the j of q3 derivative, but then we still have uh, 2 to the i times i plus 1 factorial times q to the i minus j. But now there's no n anymore. I mean, now j is arbitrary, and to... Uh, well, i is always at least 0. So the operator now is 0 for i bigger than j, and q index i minus j over a factorial times the jth derivative in q3. So that suggests already this special case that rho ij might be a differential operator. And so a general differential operator would be a sum of a polynomial in the q's times a polynomial in the d by d q's. But here you see that the polynomial in the q's is just linear. And so that worked for many, many other cases. And so that led to the ansatz that this rho j is the sum. So it's a differential operator. Remember, rho ij is a map from the polynomial ring of the qi's to itself. The ansatz is it's a differential operator, but it's even more. It's not quite a derivation or first-order operator. That would mean an arbitrary polynomial in the q's times the linear polynomial in the d by dqs. This is like the dual. If you dualize the vial algebra, which I'll actually do in a moment, so instead it becomes linear in the q case, well, including q0, which is 1, so linear at degree 0. And then there's a row ij, which is now a polynomial. Sorry, uh, let me finish writing. Can you repeat? Uh, it's because it's a, it's a typo. Sorry, this was correct. That's why. This was i minus j. It's q to the n minus j over n minus j factorial. It's simply, uh, but then it's a double typo. It must be j minus i. Thank you very much. Let's try to do it correctly. So let's compute the, the weight. Q3 is weight 3. So this is 3n, and I told you rho i minus Rho ij should have weight minus i minus 2j. 
On the right, I'll have 3 times n minus j. And then the weight of qj minus i is j minus i. And so that is indeed equal. Thank you. I, it was just a, a two typos. So it's qj minus, I think that's what I wrote first, and then I changed. Anyway, whatever I wrote, it's qj minus i uh, here, too. And of course, I don't want negative indices. Let me check that. Well, it's obviously correct, but I can still check that that's what I actually put in my notes. And I'm sure it is. Yeah, of course, it's q to the j minus i, j minus i in my notes, quite correctly. OK, so the general ansatz is going to be that it's a polynomial. Uh, here, the p's we haven't had. If you remember QK uh, of a partition was defined as a different invariant, which was PK minus 1 of the partition, plus a constant, which I call beta K, which is some rational number, also a multiple of a Bernoulli number. And I'll call the slightly modified PK. So let me write pk minus 1. It's, uh, I'm sorry for it having different notations. Little pk minus 1 is just capital QK up to a factorial, but otherwise I would have to put lots of factorials here. This turns out to be the convenient way when you dualize, you want to introduce an extra k factorial, as Paul and I were discussing yesterday. So it's natural of a polynomial. And rho ijk is going to be a specific polynomial. So it has variables u1, u2, and so on. And it's just a polynomial in those variables, which I'll generically call u underlined. So we have a sequence now of polynomials. So now it looks worse in a sense. I now have three indices, i, j, and k. But actually, you don't really need. So now I have to, to describe everything. I have to describe these maps, rho i, j of k. But actually, it's enough to just have rho k, which is the sum over all i and j, rho i, j, k. That, that's enough. So I only have to describe these maps. And the reason that's enough, first of all, that makes sense. Because remember, if I apply rho k to any given f, then uh, the rho ij of f is 0 if i plus 2j is bigger than the weight of f. So it's always a finite sum on any given argument. So this infinite sum makes sense. And the reason I haven't lost anything is that it's very easy to see that if you say that ul has weight, remember it corresponds to pl, which is ql plus 1, so it is weight l plus 1 but call it degree 1. So that if I, for instance, u3, u4, that would be something of degree 2, in that it has two u's, but its weight would be 4 plus 5, so 9. So assign u the weight l plus 1 and the degree l, then rho ij, you can see very easily from, from the fact that this has to be homogeneous, that you only get a term if k is where, if I written it, if k is, unfortunately, I can't read my handwriting. Uh, yeah, rho i j k has degree g uh, j exactly, and it is weight uh, i plus two j plus k. So if I give you just rho k then it has a bunch of terms. It's a polynomial that infinitely many, a combination of infinitely many monomials. But each monomial has a weight and a degree. And then j is the degree. And once you know j and k, i is what's left of the weight. And so you can uniquely reconstruct the i and j from, from the k on any monomial. So it's actually enough, and that's very convenient. We now, therefore, only have a collection of polynomials. But these are now polynomials in infinitely many variables. But each ij component is, is, just a, is just a polynomial, but the whole thing, so it's actually, it's not, it's now a power series, so in infinitely many variables. But each row ijk is the degree j weight i plus 2j plus k component of that. So now it's beginning to look a little better. And so then the question is, you know, now we're down to a single collection of things, and now these, there's no more differential operators. These are just power series. And so the, the next thing that you find is that rho j plus 1, rho k plus 1, is simply d of rho k. That's a corollary of this. Well, I erase it now, but remember we had a property uh, to do with the derivation. Uh, anyway, from the derivation properties of rho, you find that rho k plus 1 is a certain operator d, and d is 
the, it's, a de, it's a derivation. It's the sum i from 1 to infinity, or 0 to infinity, it won't actually matter, u sub i plus 1 d by du i. So it's a derivation on power series, uh, power series or polynomials in the u's. So that we found, and that's actually necessary. Once you've made this ansatz, this series of ansatz, first you assume that the theorem is going to be true that TPFQ is some multiple of Eisenstein series. Then you assume that that rho ij is the Q bracket of something. Then you assume, based on these examples, that the rho ij is a differential operator. Then you assume that that differential operator is linear in the Qs, uh, including Q0, but polynomial in the d by dQs, and that gives you these polynomials, and then you still, you haven't pinned it down uniquely, but you have a bunch of examples that you've conjectured, and then you find, after playing with it for a while, that it would be compatible with this form. In other words, if the thing's going to work, then you could have this. You wouldn't have to, because again, nothing is uniquely determined. The only thing that's uniquely determined are the Q brackets of these things, and that's not enough. Okay, as it stands. So now we have this formula, and so now it seems obvious that you just have to compute one thing, which is row zero, and then you can find row one, row two by applying this operator D. The only problem is we looked at this for days, and row zero, we had lots and lots of coefficients, complicated combinatorial numbers, you know, lots and lots of special cases, lemmas with multiple binomial sums, but row zero didn't have a simple formula. Then at one point, we thought, why don't we look at row one, even though that should be harder, and row one turned out, to an absolutely simple formula, there's a factor of two, and then it was simply this power series. It was two times the exponential of the sum of the u's. So rho zero is something very complicated, and now we sort of can see why, because when you differentiate that, you have to take this minus its constant term, so you can differentiate, and then you have to sort of apply d inverse, so you're integrating something, I'll write the formula in a second, but anyway, once you know rho 1, we now know rho k for every k bigger than 0 because you just apply d many times to rho 1. So now we almost have the answer, and that finally gives the final formula, which I'll now just write. So I, say I won't say the proof at all, but at least you see then they have a completely well-defined theorem. With this definition, then the previous statements become a theorem. So the formula now finally is that this rho k of u, well, the way to give a series of anything in mathematics is always to make a generating function. That's a universal rule. So here, the generating function, the good one, is the exponential one with factorials. So you introduce an indeterminate v, and you make the sum rho k of u, v to the k over k factorial. Another form is actually exceedingly simple. I don't know quite what happened to the two there. Uh, there's something wrong with the factor of two. Maybe, maybe it's correct. I copied it from the paper. It should be correct. So what you do is you take these indeterminants, uj, and you use them to make an associated power series, which we already knew was the kind of crucial way to see these uj's, uh, to take the power series some uj d by dtj. Okay? And then in terms of that notation, then you take this power series. I could start with zero if you want. You can have u zero, but of course, when I take the difference, the u zero will drop out anyway. And now when you expand that thing, uh, it's a power series in t, and you integrate it as a formal power series in t from v to v plus one. You get a power series in v, and the coefficient of v to the k over k factorial, that's rho k of u. So as I say, it took a long, long time to even discover this formula, and then many more months till we finally found a proof, and it's quite an indirect uh, thing using, of course, well, using everything about the, these Q's brackets. How am I doing for time? It must be, oh, it's, I've already gone over the time till the pause. So let's have a f five or six minute break, as usual, and you can stare at this formula if you want, or not stare at it, and then I'll talk about the beginning of how you apply this, then it becomes much simpler. This is the heaviest part of the course. This, uh, Okay, so let's make a brief break. Okay, so I'm now, as I say, going to turn to something a little easier. Uh, 
Uh, others. So, so the main hero in my story in the last couple of weeks has been the blocher kungloff theorem, once again, which maybe I should emphasize once again, given the uh, question uh, I was just asked during the pause. You take these special functions on partitions, q1. Q, q1 is a completely trivial function, it's 0. q2 is a completely trivial function, it's the size of a partition plus a constant. But all the rest are not at all obvious functions that you can give by closed form in terms of Frobenius coordinates, but there's some very subtle functions. And then the theorem is that if you apply the block of kung, or the um, Q bracket to that, that you get modular forms or quasi-modular forms, to be more precise. So there's a big drawback in this theorem, uh, which is that we don't know what the answer is. There's, there's an inductive procedure I wonder, maybe I wasn't going to do that, but in my, the paper that I wrote on this where I found this elementary proof that I gave, I also gave an inductive description. I'm wondering, let me just look at it quickly. I hadn't thought of doing that, whether it's worth... Yeah, maybe it's actually worth giving. Uh, so let me emphasize the things I want to say. There's no closed formula that we know, even... Uh, so what would I mean by a closed form? You cannot reasonably expect in mathematics, even for a much simpler operator, closed in the sense that you just take an arbitrary monomial in the Qs and do something. But if you have a polynomial thing, what you would expect is that you might have the generating function of the numbers. So you, of course, since the Qis are generators, you could have... Uh, you know, it's enough to know the Q brackets of monomials in the Q, and you might imagine a generating function, but nobody's been able to find a closed formula. There is a kind of a recursive definition which is axiomatic, and it, since it's a little Q, let me say it briefly. I wasn't actually going to do that, but let me do that anyway. So remember that if I have a partition, then, well, first of all, I don't have a partition. I just have W of Z. Uh, will be the sum qk z to the k minus 1, k from 0 to infinity, which is in the bloch kunkov ring. It's a Laurent series. Well, I'll use my notation that I learned actually already existed. So Laurent series I write as polynomial in z inverse and power series in z. In z. So you have this, and so w lambda of z, if lambda is a partition, is the sum qk of lambda, z to the k minus 1. And if you remember, when I actually defined these things, this was the same as the sum j from 1 to infinity. And you took e to the power lambda j minus j plus a half times z. If the real part of z is negative, then this sum converges. And it converges, and as I explained in an earlier lecture, this will always be equal to z over t over sin z over t plus a rational function, oh, sorry, a Laurent polynomial in e to the power z over 2. Actually, it's e to the z over 2 times the Laurent polynomial e to the z. So it's uh, that you get uh, sort of an explicit way. And so if you expand this, this will start, you know, 1 over z plus uh, lambda minus the 24th times z plus etc. You know, the next term would be nu t of z times z squared, and so on, a nu t of lambda. OK, so we have this power series. And so you can look at the endpoint function. And that's also what Bloch and Kunkov do in their paper. And they give a formula for it as a determinant of theta series that I probably won't write down. So f, well, I can call it n for n points, but you don't really need it because it's a power series in n variables. And you can see the n by just looking how many variables there are. And this is defined as the Q series of the product W of Z1. So therefore, that's the same as the sum K1 up to Kn all go from 0 to infinity of QK1 
up to qkn, and then z1 to the k1 minus 1, up to zn to the kn minus 1. So here, this is not, there are two ways of making a generating function. One would be to take powers of the qrs, and the other would be to take this thing. And so that's two different approaches. But obviously, if you know either this or this for all n, then you know all of these things. But as I already said, we don't. So there's no really convenient closed form to, for the endpoint function. There is as a determinant that they give. But there's also the following axiomatic description. So theorem fn for n greater than 0 are the unique Laurent series in many variables. So Laurent uh, uh, series uh, satisfying. So first of all, there's a normalization condition that f0, which has no arguments at all, so it has to be a constant, is the constant 1. Then another almost trivial property is fn of z1 to zn is symmetric in its n variables, in its n arguments. So that's a trivial property, which is trivially true. The third property will tell you that there's only a simple pole. This looks faintly like topological recursion a little bit. I mean, it's a recursion, uh, but it's, it also kind of uses residues, but in a very, very much simpler way. So if you just take the pole part, uh, let's say with respect to Zn, then the, it has only a simple pole. So by induction, they'll only leave simple poles because it's, I mean, it'll be at most simple poles in each Zi because it's symmetric or by induction. The pole, the residue of 1 over Zn is just the previous one. That part's easy. But the main part is that the next term is 0. So you could imagine at plus 0, I don't really have to write that, plus O of Zn. So as a power series in Zn, it has the power Zn to the minus 1, and that coefficient is Fn minus 1. But the constant term of the power series is 0, unless, of course, n is 0 when the whole thing is a constant. So this is the uh, key property. And then there's one more property, and it's kind of very cute. And this is the one that led me to the uh, identity that I gave last time, which gave the very simple proof of the locke kunkov theorem. So let me remind you, once again, of the theta series. So remember that we have theta of x, which depends on q. So it'll actually be a power series uh, coefficient in q, actually, in z. Uh, in x, and the coefficients will be in q to the actually 1 8th. Uh, and this was the sum nu in z plus a half, which I called f of minus 1 to the nu minus a half, q to the power nu squared over 2, e to the power nu x. So this was the classical theta series. And we saw that this was equal to theta prime of 0, which in, it, in itself is 8 of tau cubed. And if you remember, 8 of tau is q to the 124th times the product 1 minus q to the n. So that's the constant term. And then this is 1 plus h2 times x squared plus h4 times x to the fourth, and so on, where h2 is e2 over 24. And I wrote down the next few. h k is a quasi-modular form of weight k. So I used this data series already in the uh, uh, inductive in the elementary proof of the block of Kunkov theorem. And now the statement is very nice. You multiply this thing, the Fn, you multiply it by theta of the sum of the Zi's. And now that's still a Laurent series. I mean, theta is a power series. So you multiply it by this theta. It's actually more convenient to take theta over theta prime of 0, but that won't affect the statement. This is a Laurent series by induction in lots of variables, in n variables. So it has a certain number of negative terms, but it'll have the power series part. So the power series part means all parts where all of the exponents are non-negative. OK? And that I denote by plus, the plus part. And now that looks, you say, that's so complicated. Whatever I write, it's too complicated. But what I write is rather easy. It's just 0. So and that's the whole thing. That's all you need. And this, again, proves by induction that all of the Fn have coefficients that are quasi-modular. Because, of course, here, I could divide by theta prime of zero. That wouldn't change this being zero. And then theta is a power series whose coefficients are quasi-modular. And then by induction, everything is quasi-modular. So this inductive uh, description or recursive 
description of the uh, endpoint functions is kind of cute. I don't know if there are, there are endpoint functions all over, well, of course, quantum field theory, but in this whole field that this activity is about. I don't know if any of the other endpoint functions have a similar recursive structure if it's worth looking for. But anyway, this is very explicit here and, and rather simple. That's kind of a nice theorem that I was happy to, to find. I mean, it's, but I actually found this by working backwards from what Bloch and Kunkov did. And then from this, I got the theorem I told you, the theta of d of certain f's was 0. And then that turned out to have a simple proof of one line. And then from that, you could get this. And then you could get their form and give the whole thing backwards. So this was not an ind independent discovery. This sort of is a simplification, or it comes out of some inductive structure that was implicit in what they did. OK, so that's so much for that. So that's the endpoint function. And, but now I come back to what I was saying, that there's no reasonable formula for f. There are formulas for each one as determinants, but they quickly get out of hand. I actually wrote the formulas for a couple of them uh, one time ago. Maybe I'll even give the formulas now, from their, essentially from their paper. So the first one is 1 over theta of z, except you have to divide by theta of z. So this starts, you know, 1 minus h2 times z squared and so on. So it's got quasi-multiple coefficients. Then f2, which is about f0, of course, is 1. We already know. f2 of z1, z2 is theta prime of 0 over theta of z1 plus z2. And now you take theta prime of z1 over theta of z1 and you symmetrize it. And it, so this is the symmetrization of just a simple product. And in general, each fn, but I'll write just the next one because then the formulas get very complicated. You symmetrize, you always have the factor in front, which is theta prime of 0 over the sum, theta of the sum of the z's. And then you completely symmetrize. So here there'll be six terms. I'll just write one of them. And then it's theta prime over theta of z1 times theta prime over theta of z1 plus z2 minus theta double prime over theta of 2z1 minus uh, g2, which is uh, e2 over, plus e2 over 24. And then you know they get more and more complicated. But in principle, each one looks something like this. It's some kind of a, of a determinant in theta prime symmetrized appropriately. Anyway, it's some complicated thing. Uh, but those are the first three. So you can say that's a closed formula, but you can't really write it down for any. I mean, for n equals 4, it's already a mess. And you can't really say in a very nice form what it is. But now there is something very nice. And this was a discovery in a later paper of Eskin and Okunkov. And for that. I want to say I already mentioned it in my conference talk and last time, that there's going to be a map, which I'll call the evaluation map in the variable x, which will associate to any quasi-modular form just a polynomial. And for the moment, to save time, there's a more intrinsic definition. I'll just give it uh, in terms of generators, because from the intrinsic definition, which I'm going to skip, it's a ring homomorphism. And so in this particular case, you can define it for any group. So this is not really the definition. There's an intrinsic definition for quasi multiple forms on any group, which I maybe will say something about. But in the case of SL2z, since it's a ring homomorphism, I only have to say where these things go. This goes to x squared. This goes to x cubed. In general, if f is any modular form, not quasi, but modular form of weight 2k, remember there are no modular forms of odd weight, then you just go to the constant term times x to the k. So it's a very boring map on modular forms. It's just the constant term of the series multiplied by x to the weight. And if you remember what it, uh, for the Bloch-Kunkov map, if you apply this to Bloch-Kunkov thing, this map, the constant term, by definition, is just the value of your function on partitions on the empty partition. So it's really just evaluation on the empty partition multiplied by x to the weight. But if it's quasi-modular, it's slightly trickier because this is weight 2. So x is k is 1. You'd have x. The constant term of e2 is 1. But you don't get x, you get x plus 12. And therefore, in general, if you have, sorry, this is if it's a modular form. But in general, if f is a quasi-modular form, uh, uh, of weight 2k, then the evaluation x of f, 
I think I use square brackets, will always start a0 x to the k plus lower terms. So if it's a modular form, it'll just be homogeneous of degree k, but otherwise there's x, k, k minus 1, k minus 2, up to k minus p, where p is the depth of the function, which is its degree as a function of e2. OK, so you have this evaluation polynomial. And the discovery of Estin Okunkov, but I'll give, well, I'll give their formula, but then I'll give uh, uh, our formula, which is simpler to, in a sense, simpler and also much simpler to prove, and then implies their formula. So we got also a new proof. But the main theorem is Estin Okunkov, that if you take, let me define f. So if f is in the block of Kunga, bring, let me define the x bracket. Don't think of x as being q. It's just a symbol. And so it's a different symbol. You take the block of Kunkov thing and you apply this homomorphism. So now you get a polynomial in x. And the theorem, I'll write it more explicitly in a second. But this one is computable in closed form. So in other words, we don't have a closed form for the whole q bracket as a multiple form. But if you make this weakening, which keeps a little bit into account the quasi-multidarity and uh, the weight and, and the constant term and sort of some information about the multiple form. So it's weaker, but you've, there's a loss of information. Then you get this. And the other important fact is that if f is any quasi-multiple form, so f is some sum n q to the n, which is a quasi-multiple form, then the evaluation function of x gives the asymptotics, I'm not going to be more precise yet, but roughly, if you take the partial sum of the first capital N coefficients of the multiple form, that grows in a well way. And at least the leading term of the asymptotics, you can deduce if you know this. So that's why we care about this. If you remember from Martin Miller's lecture, we're going to use all of this, these counting functions, like the original one, remember, q3 to the n, q3 to the 2g minus 2. The q bracket had to do with counting coverings uh, in genus g of a torus. And when you put something more general, like maybe q3 to the 2g minus two, q to 3 to the some power uh, times some other qk, this will count some kind of modified Horvitz light number, some coverings with appropriate profiles. It's not quite like that. But it counts something geometric. But now if you think of covering not just a topological surface, but the standard complex surface, C modulo Z plus ZI, then you get specific surfaces in the moduli space, which are lifts. They're the square tiled surfaces together with the differential just DZ lifted from this standard thing. And those things become very dense in the space of flat surfaces. And so in N, the degree of the covering is very, very large. You have a huge number of a discrete, finite number, but a huge collection of points in that moduli space. And if you just count them with the appropriate measure, that should tell you what the volume is. And so to get the volume, you can reduce it to an arithmetic property of counting. But you only care about the asymptotics when N is very large. And so what you care about in the end is the sum of the coefficients of the multiple form that will tell you how many of these things there are. And so in the final analysis, the, f the final statement uh, becomes that you get information that I'll talk about tomorrow. Uh, let me see if, if I want to say anything a little more detailed about this evaluation function. But you get information about the asymptotics of the coefficients, which is what you need to compute the volumes uh, from the combinatorial thing of counting ramified coverings of the torus. You get that information by. Uh, uh, by looking at these evaluation polynomials. And therefore, it's absolutely crucial that you have to be able to compute them. And so here's the formula. So let me now give some examples. Sorry? Sorry, this is the definition. Thank you. So I define fx as the bracket of fq. And the statement is that although the q bracket wasn't computable, its evaluation is. So let me give a couple of examples. I don't know how far I'll get today. And then I'll continue tomorrow. So let's first take the evaluation polynomial of theta. So theta, remember, I just erased it, but theta of x, well, let's take divide by the silly constant term, because that's just a constant. It wouldn't change. Well, no, in fact, I do want that, because that's the one that's holomorphic. Remember, it was some h2 x squared plus h4 times x to the fourth, and so on. And there was actually a closed formula for h, which I gave, I think, last time. Sorry? 
sorry, this is, it's a completely different X, but it's hard to tell my handwriting. This is a capital X, and this is a small X, and therefore it's not the same. But even if they'd been the same letter, it wouldn't have been the same X. But in fact, they were meant to be physically different letters, not very successful. So uh, when I talked about theta before, both in the conference and I think when I talked last time, I gave the, in, the intrinsic formula so you can write Hn. Well, the simplest way to write it is uh, H2n, uh, since it has to be even, is 1 over 2n plus 1 factorial times the operator d, which is, remember, qd by dq, 2d plus uh, e2 over 4 to the nth. And then you apply that operator to 1. So that's, you just keep applying it inductively. So that means there's an inductive formula that this is, well, it's obviously the same as saying uh, d plus e2 of, so it's dh2n minus 1 plus e2 over 8, if I got it right, times h r 2 n minus 2. So there's an inductive formula, I and mean, of course h0 is 1 and h1 is 0, and then you, you get each h inductively from this. So now if you use the properties of the evaluation polynomial, which as I said, they're axiomatic things that I didn't write out, but I can give one of them. So an easy one is that the evaluation of df for any multiple form is uh, xd by dx plus the weight times the original evaluation polynomial. So if you apply, if you differentiate a form, that's sort of an easy, well, you, you have to know how the definition works, but it's, that's the formula. And so that means that I can compute, since I know each h2n in terms of the previous one, and e2, and e2 I already told you goes to x plus 12, I can now inductively compute h2n, and so I get a, an explicit formula for these numbers h2n. And that formula is not very interesting, but I'll write it down anyway. So if I take the kth, but it's more convenient to call it 2k because it has to be even, if I take the evaluation of h2k, then it's the sum m plus n equals k. This form is of no interest at all. I'm just writing it for completeness. 2 to the n m factorial times 2n plus 1 factorial times x over 4 to the n. So that's the explicit polynomial, just to give an example of this evaluation map. But what that then tells you, which is less trivial, and then I'll explain what the evaluation map is really doing, and then you'll see where this is coming from. What this tells me is that if I take the sum uh, Hn of capital X, so let me call this, let me call this H, just little h, so I have a notation for it. If I take the sum Hn of x z to the n plus 1, so this is the an odd power series, then if I insert this formula and do a tiny bit of calculation, I get e to the z squared over 2 times hyperbolic sinh, sine, so sinh of z squared of x over 2 divided by square root of x over 2. But there are no square root of x's because sinh is odd. So this is a power series in x and in z, but the coefficient of any power of z is a polynomial. So I can think of this as the evaluation function. If I remember what hn was, this is just theta of x divided by theta prime of 0. Sorry? Theta of? You're absolutely right. Theta of z. Thank you. Here it turned into z, which is even less easy to confuse with x than a small x. OK, thank you. So if you apply uh, you know, theta of z over the theta prime zero as a power series with quasi multi coefficients, then the theta function, which is already not very complicated, turns into the sinh function, which is easier. So now we can compute the evaluation maps of the first three of uh, So if I take this first power series, it's 1 over theta prime over theta, but the evaluation map's a homomorphism. So this, therefore, will be e to the minus e squared over 2 times the square root of x over 2. Something has gone wrong, and I don't like it, but it should be exactly like that. Uh, let me.
okay, this is really horrible. Uh, well, first of all, this is hard to read. So let me write, let me now write, oh, but this is really poor notation. So it's not the x of before. The x of before has become z, and now little x is simply square root of x over 2. So I don't have to keep writing it. So this is x e to the minus z squared over 2 over sinh of xz, where x is now that. So then similarly, if I take the evaluation map at x of f2 of z1, z2, then if I apply what we have here, I have to apply this formula to z1 plus z2. So I get x e to the minus z1 plus z2 squared over 2 divided by sinh of x times z1 plus z2. And then I have to apply it to this thing, and then I have to apply it to this thing. And so if I do that and do a little bit of thinking, you know, just identities of trigonometric or rather hyperbolic functions, you can write those theta primes, one over theta prime like that. And now it's still a mess, but now if you use the hyperbolic addition law, then this simplifies and it becomes z1 plus z2 squared over 2 times x times z1 plus z2 over sinh of x times z1 plus z2 plus, and now it's x over sinh x times z1 times x over sinh x times z2. And so the Eskino-Kungo formula, I'm not going to write down. You can do the next one by hand using this and then playing quite a bit with the addition law of hyperbolic sine. You'll find that if you do evaluation 3, it's the same. You'll get e to the minus the sum of these e's squared over 2. And then you'll have a sum of products of x over sinh of x times some z, where that z will run over all partial sums of z1 plus z2 plus z3 uh, with some multiplicity in general. So in general, that will always be the form. Uh, maybe I won't write it in that form. This will always be e to the minus the sum of the zi's squared over 2 times some sum of products of xzi over sinh xzi. There may be a multiplicity here that I don't remember. And zi I runs over all subsets of the set from 1 up to n. And zi is the sum of the corresponding z little i. So that's the closed formula. It's still not at all convenient because it's only a closed formula for the nth, uh, the nth endpoint function for each n separately. So it's not a generating function for the whole thing. So let me briefly say what that is. And then I might be able to say a few words about cumulants. And then the so today was the most technical day, I warned you. And tomorrow, uh, then we can reap the rewards and write some get some corollaries and some fun statements. But just to, to finish this story, so the right way to do it, in a sense, I mean, the way that's more convenient and that actually people in, you know, anyway, always do if they possibly can, is to work instead with the um, partition function. So I want to write, so now let me write the partition function, but now I want to get to the right notations and I didn't copy that by hand, so I better look it up in the paper, except that I've permuted all the pages. I know it's here. Yeah, I'm getting there. Ay, ay, ay. Here we go. OK, so yeah, I was given these special examples. And now I want to give the, the whole thing. So I'm going to make, I'm going to take u to be u1, u2, and they're actually the same ul variables as the ones I had before, sort of dual to the small pl. So remember, small pl was equal to l factorial times q sub l plus 1, and, they, and then the, the, the dual variables. So we had them before, the ul deep down corresponds to d by dpl in the previous thing that I did. But now I'm going to have instead the sum the partition function of the, of the block of Kunkov numbers. And I'm going to define it is phi of u, which is u1, u2, and so on. But this is the q partition function, so to speak. 
will be, and now you just take x of the sum PLUL. So as I said, the P's are just the Q's, but renormalized and starting with Q2. Anyway, Q1 is 0, so it's not very interesting. And then you take the Q bracket of that. So if you multiply that, you can write that in two different ways. One is that you write the sum over R1, R2, and so on, all greater than or equal to 0. This would be a pure partition function, P1 to the power uh, R1, P2 to the power R2, etc. Q, and then U1 to the R1 over R1 factorial, U2 to the R2 over R2 factorial. So that's one way to write it as a generating function. So if you have this, then you really have enclosed form. If you know this function, if you knew this function, which we don't, then we would have a closed form for all of these. But you could also write it as the sum, and now you fix instead the length, and then you have to divide by n factorial for the orders, and then you'd have here the sum over all L1 up to Ln, which are at least 1, and you'd have P1, PL1 up to PLN, Q bracket times UL1 up to ULN. So these are the two alternative ways of writing it. And then you can write this part here. Uh, well, this you cannot write in terms of the partition function. Uh, as it's, or, or can you? I can't do it in my head. Maybe you, you can, but anyway, this is, no, you see, this would be the, yeah, this is not at all in terms of the endpoint function, but the information of this thing is equivalent to the information contained in the endpoint function. But it's encoded completely differently. It's a completely different generating function with very different, uh, you know, I mean, they're put together in a different way, but the individual coefficients are the same up to various factorials. So it's like the exponential generating function, the usual generating functions, completely different ones. But this is the convenient one, except that we still, as I said, if we had a formula for this, then you could read off all the coefficients. I would call that a closed form, but we don't. But now I also define the x partition function is the same. It's a power series again in the x's. So this thing is going to be a power series in the u's whose coefficients are quasi-multiple forms. Each individual monomial will have a coefficient that's a quasi-multiple form of the appropriate weight. But now when I apply uh, the evaluation polynomial, I call that thing 5ux. And now, if we have any closed formula for this, then we do have a closed formula for everything. And so that's what, uh, what we found. And probably I'll just end with that, I think, and talk about cumulants next time. But I still have, you know, I might be able to say a few words about cumulants even today. Oh, except that I also forgot to mention the corollary of the theorem before the break. Uh, so I might still do that. So here, now I want to write the final theorem for this thing. So the theorem that uh, Miller and I proved, well, it's in the paper with, with Chen, but as I said, in that paper, the, there are sort of two disjoint parts. They did everything, and I take no credit for anything to do with the uh, multi space theory. In fact, they had done that before I joined the thing, and then this part was Miller and I did all this uh, sort of numerical combinatorics with the multiple forms. But anyway, this theorem is that the phi of u is given by a very nice the Gaussian integral. So I'll write it as a Gaussian integral, except that I want to shift it. I should really integrate over the imaginary axis. I'll put i y x just to keep things rational, and then dy. But anyway, this could be a power series where B is some explicit power series. So remember, u is the thing that we, we want to get these variables. x is the variable of my evaluation polynomial. And then y, and I'll just call it y. Well, you can do it in two forms. You can give it explicitly as a power series in all of the ui's and the y's and the x's. Well, maybe actually I will do that because it's actually not very, I mean, it's, it's a huge sum. But the coefficients are individually very simple. So if I have a1, a2 greater than or equal to 0, so it's a power series in infinitely many variables. And then I'll have u to the a over a factorial, the obvious meaning product u to the i to the ai over ai factorial, y to the r over r factorial. And then the power 
of x will be actually uh, something over 2. I'll just call it k times beta, and I can write k here. So k is an abbreviation of 2 minus r plus a2 plus, three, uh, plus 2 a3. So a2, a1 plays no role in this number. Beta k is the same number that we had before. It was the coefficient of z to the k in z over 2 over sin to z over 2. So it's just a Bernoulli number times some simple factor. Uh, and then there's still a factorial in front, a1 plus 2a2 plus 3a3, and so on factorial. So that's actually a very, very simple formula in that each coefficient of x to the anything u to the something r to the anything is very simple. And in fact, it's 0 unless k. So I could add the k, but k has to be equal to this, or you won't get a coefficient. If k is negative or odd, then beta k is 0. And so that's the formula. But of course, that's still a very complicated formula in that it's a huge multiply infinite sum. But then the last thing I can say about this is that, and from this, we quite easily deduce the formula that I said here, the Eskenokunkov theorem, so that becomes somehow an easier theorem. But this is, for all of the applications, or for several of the applications, this is more convenient because you now have everything in a single generating function. And next time, I'll explain, we're going to have a thing with cumulus. Next time, I'll talk about cumulants, which are, if you have various elements in the block of Kunkov ring, then instead of multiplying them, you take some combination called the nth cumulant. And that corresponds to connected coverings. Some, and essentially, for that, you have to take the log of this thing and find its asymptotics. And so for that, it would be useless to have the individual endpoint functions for each n. You need this global formula. So maybe I'll end for today, except for maybe still saving the corollary that I forgot, if I have time. I'll give the closed formula for b, the kind of nice formula, and then I end with that, except I've, I meant to write that by hand, but I ran out of uh, time this morning. And I was preparing, so where the heck is the formula gone? Ah, I should have stapled the thing. Here we go. OK, so the th theorem is this. We use the same power series that I used before. Remember these u's. I had to think of a power series and remember that rho k at some integral of e to the u of t minus u of t minus 1 dt. So this is the basic power series you use. And now you solve uh, t of y is going to be a power series. And it's going to start like this, u1 over 1 minus u1 y plus u2 over 1 minus u1 cubed times y squared plus 2u2 squared over 1 minus u1 to the fifth plus u3 over 1 minus u1 to the fourth times y cubed, etc. So it's going to be a power series. And this is the solution. You can find this very quickly on the computer just by Newton's method. You just iterate. Or you solve the equation t of y is u of y plus t of y. OK. Then. Uh, B, so remember we had these numbers beta 0 is 1, beta 1 is 0, beta 2 is minus the 24th, beta 3 is 0, and so on. We have these numbers. Then B of u and y and x, the x is actually unimportant because you can rescale it because of this formula. You can just absorb it, but I'll give it anyway. It's the sum k from 0 to infinity of beta k times the k minus first derivative. Remember, in the other theorem, we had the k minus first derivative, but we had a slight problem when k was 0. You had to integrate once. It'll be the same thing here. Uh, but that's the whole formula. So the formula is beta k, which is 0 unless k is even. So x to the k over 2 is a power series in x. And the coefficient of x to the k over 2 is simply the k minus first derivative of this t that comes from the Lagrange inversion multiplied by this modified Bernoulli number beta k. And the only thing is t, min uh, t the minus first derivative is, of course, just the interval with no constant term. So that's a very simple closed form, then. It's the same as this just by using Lagrange in inversion and fiddling for a bit. So this means it has a very, very simple form. You just have to invert one power series, and you get the whole thing. So this is the basic formula that gives the closed formula. This is the full partition function, completely enclosed form. You can integrate this 
is they just as a formal Gaussian integral, just using the standard thing that e to the minus y squared over 2 u to the n or y to the n dn is 0 if n is odd. And if n is even, it's n minus 1 double factorial, something like well, 1 over square root of 2 pi. So you know, just using the standard thing that you get either 0 or n minus 1 double factorial, this is just a formal expression and gives you as many coefficients as you want of the block of thing after you apply the evaluation map. So that's that result, and I'll, I'll stop. Uh, there was still a corollary. Uh, so remember, I started today with the TPs, where P was positive, but we actually cared about T minus 1. I gave a closed formula, and that will give a very nice corollary for T minus 1, but I'll state that next time. That's, it's next time we'll need it for the Siegel Veach application. Next time being tomorrow and also the last time. So thank you for, for now. So I hope there are questions because that was not meant to be clear. Uh, Paul, first. In what? I mean, there are people who like graphs. I'm not one of those people. You can take any Gaussian integral of all, e to the minus y squared times a power series, expand it, and think of it in terms of a sum over graphs. And people who like graphs, Feynman graphs, and so on, love that. I don't see the advantage. If you, if you want the 50th coefficient, you have to write down all graphs on 50 things. There are trillions of them. There's no way to compute them. And your computer can't handle it, because you can't, in a computer program, conveniently have graphs. You have to, unless you number the graphs and say which, in, you can't draw a lot of pictures. So up to q equals 3, you know, graphs are nice. But this, to me, is very easy. You just have a power series. You exponentiate. And then every time you see y to the n, you just put n minus 1 double factorial. But of course, everything like this has a Feynman graph expansion in principle. And one could work it out. And whether it would say something, I don't know. And of course, there has to become a connection of all of these theorems, everything I'm telling, and topological recursion where we've discussed that some with Martin Muller, we've started with Gaetan, we haven't yet gotten very far. Some of the formalism is exactly parallel, but we haven't actually written down you know, a specific spectral curve and a specific collection of omega GNs and a specific specialization, which gives, well, ideally, you wouldn't want just the X evaluation, because we know that. We would like the Q evaluation by topological recursion. It still wouldn't be a closed formula. It would be recursive. But so far, we don't even have that, but we haven't tried that hard. So I think this whole la language of sums over graphs and so on, one can use it here. But it's computation, it's much, much less effective. First of all, it's very complicated to, to program because you're summing over graphs. But also, you have far more terms. This, it's much easier to have a power series. When you exponentiate, you just get a new power series. There's just one variable, 1, 2, 3, up to 100. And you have you know, something very small to work with, whereas the sum over graphs very quickly degenerates out of sight. And of course, topological recursion, also the GF the coefficient has you know, something like at least 2 to the g uh, term. So if g is at all large, you, you can't actually do it term for term. Whereas here, you have no trouble at all. We've programmed that. And here, you can go east up to quite a high g, because especially if you specialize the use, then this is all just power series in one variable. So this is somehow very effective to, for computation. But basically, the answer is yes, but I don't know the details. Stavros, you also. Uh, that's a good question. It does include linear terms if r is 1 or even r is 0. But then it's, it's higher powers of u. So it's infinitesimal. So I haven't yet. This isn't exactly expanded around the top, the saddle point. I mean, this form is true also if n is 0 or also if n is 1. So you can always put, so if you have e to the minus y squared over 2 times any function of y, you can always shift and look at the new maximum. But if the Next term, the linear and smaller terms are infinitesimal. They're in terms of some other, they're multiplied by some indeterminate, which is very small. You can do that infinitesimal shift, but it's much easier to integrate the way it was and just live with that. So there's no reason that you always have to make things you know, move to the exact center of the thing. So in, indeed, no, and that puzzled us. We, we, at the first, we kept trying to make it a pure Gaussian, and it isn't because this contains linear terms. But anyway, it still isn't a pure Gaussian because it also contains cubic terms. And four, I mean, it's not just e to the y squared. But in fact, if you look at this, you'll see everything except the term when a and r are both 0 is of higher degree in, well, k you can't tell, but at least in the u's. So if the u's are infinitesimal, all of this is a power series, 
what you really want to be thinking is as a power series, you exponentiate this. This is a sum of something or other times u1 to the something, u2 to the something. And then if you look at this just from the definition, then you see that those coefficients, from this definition, those coefficients are the things you want. And that, of course, is, is a, it's a Gaussian time, some polynomial, which, which may not be, may have a linear term. Yeah. I saw another hand. Yeah. No, of course not. Uh, the kernel is absolutely huge. I mean, remember the, the kernel of the Q, Q bracket map? Uh, absolutely not. What we're doing is this. I have a vector space in each n. I have a vector space, q to the power p n, which, if I choose the obvious basis, just numbering the partitions, is q to the power p of n. So if, you know, if n is 100, this is, I, I forget what p of 100 is, but let's say it's 10 to the 12th or something. So I have a huge vector space. And I'm, I'm taking, wait, let, let me answer the question. I'm taking the map. I'm just add all the coefficients. So it's really a stupid map. It's the forgetful map. I'm only, I'm only keeping the sum of the coefficients. So the kernel is everything where the sum of the coefficients is zero, but it's absolutely huge. It doesn't, it, it doesn't make sense. No, absolutely not. There's, there's no way. It's absolutely, the block of Kuhn-Kopf ring is absolutely, it, it's not, a, it's not, f first of all, it wouldn't be particularly interesting because it wouldn't be an ideal. It would be just some sub-vector space. But, but no, I mean, there, it, it means, no, there's, there's, as far as I know, no. I mean, everybody asks that. We ask that, too, because you have a map, and it's surjective. And so you think, well, you just divide by the kernel. But the kernel is just the kernel. It's what goes to zero. This map goes from a huge vector space to a tiny vector space. So it's got an immense kernel. And there's just, so you, you, your question, of course, makes more sense on Boko Kunkov. Here, you're just projecting completely. You're just adding the coefficients. So, you know, to look at all partitions that have functions that happened if average value is zero, well, you know, so what? That's, uh, it, you can't do anything. But the intersection of that with Blanco Kunkov, as far as I know, there's absolutely no description. Another question people ask is, how about a subring which maps to modular forms as opposed to quasi-modular? And that, in principle, I can describe, because if you remember, I gave a formula for German G, which is essentially d by dE2, of the Blanco Kunkov map that was formed I found and that I explained here with some second order operator d plus d squared, or maybe minus d squared over 2 times f q. So there's some second order, pure second order differential operator. And the kernel of that are the functions that would give modular forms. Oh, sorry, that's not the definition. If you're in the kernel, you get a modular form. But of course, lots of things wouldn't be in the kernel. We'd still give a modular form. It seems not to, not to be possible at all and not to make sense to us that. The thing is so big that the kernel is sort of practically everything. You're, it's really a weak invariant. That would be like asking, is the reasonable description of the set of all manifolds whose order characteristic is zero? Well, no, not really. It's just invariant, and of course, sometimes it's zero. But you can't expect, it's so much bigger manifolds than order characteristic. And here it's the same. This is so huge. This is a much weaker invariant. And of course, it's even weaker when we take the x. But uh, the only thing that you do have, but this is a real triviality, is that the constant term of this, that you can say what it is is just the value on the empty partition. And I can tell you the value of, the, of QK on the empty partition. So that one I can do, constant term. OK, I think it's time to go home, <laughs> meeting upstairs. <laughs>